It's not hot in here. I know, right? It's good. Especially with that shoe game. Tell me about those shoes. Uh, the best shoe game in show business, I swear to no, God. No, you, man. You. Um, but don't get me started because I am a sneakerhead. No, these are um, a collab, a different collab that uh, Kanye did with uh, Adidas. The, the Calabasas situation with the vintage Adidas logo and beautiful cream color. Like, um, I'm excited. They're a summer shoe, man. I'm excited about these. I'm just trying to stand in your shadow black I almost wore the white me. Yeezys when I was like, well, I'm not going to hurt them like that today. <laughs> I almost did that. But I was like, nah, because you would have fainted. No, it's just here. warm in here. That's all. I'll be okay. Uh -huh. don't, mind, don't mind me. Come on. I see the sock game, you know, coordinating with the shirt and the... The Air Max, come on, brother. I see you. I see you. Come I work, on. I work really hard on these little outfits. So please, <laughs> please don't I'm call me. I'm feeling it. Out. That's, that's the Barack Obama out. special right there. I saw his painting. Come on. Wow. I love so, the inspiration. So I'm wearing dad sneakers. Thank you. <laughs> no. That hurt. You're killing it right now. No, no, I'm not killing anything. But yeah, speaking sure. of killing, let me ask you this. Yes. Because I always thought one of the most interesting things about you is when you talked about the the um, modern family script you wrote that you basically kind of made it about you. Oh yeah, I did. Talk Damn. about that a little Classic bit. Classic Elvis, already kicking off, come on. Um, yeah, whoa, that's like a throwback. This is like an Inside the Actor Studio moment. Um, I wow, that's wrote, even worse than the Obama thing. Oh, now I'm a fat old white guy. No, oh. James Lipton is the shit. He's no you, he's no you. You're our, come on, you were before him. Um, no, I wrote a, a Modern Family spec many moons ago and the character Manny um, wanted to, he wanted to go as Effie for Halloween from Dreamgirls. And the dad, his, um, Jay. Jay, whose stepfather, I'm sorry, um, was freaking out that he might be gay. And the thing was, is he thought maybe, because obviously he has a gay son on the show, he thought maybe it was something he had done because he was like, oh, this is another one. Not that that's bad, but he's like, what is happening? What do, what do I, what's in my dad genes that's making my sons possibly gay? And so people really dug that spec and it got me a lot of attention, but yeah, man. Because I just think that's really interesting. Rather than going the obvious way and, and, and writing, you know, doing a, a blackish or something like that, mm -hmm. the, the idea of, and I think want everybody here to hear this, that mm -hmm. you can find a way to fold yourself into anything. And right. what it ends up doing is taking what seems idiosyncratic and making it universal, doesn't right. it? Right, yeah. And Ali Leroy, it's interesting you say that because I'd written a 30 Rock spec and then I'd written a Modern Family spec and it's funny because a piece of advice Ali Leroy gave me, and he and I have since become friends, but I went to a panel that he was on, speaking of a panel not unlike this, that I went to and I asked him a question. I was like, what advice do you have for me? He's like, don't write black shows in terms of specs. He's like, you're a black person. I assume that you can write black characters. That's a given. He was like, go write a show that somebody wouldn't expect you as a black woman to be able to write well. He's like, that's kind of how you can surprise people. And the advice was really great because um, those, are, those are episodes, the, the scripts I got a lot of attention for, which was 30 Rock Spec and the Modern Family Spec because people were so shocked that like this black girl could like really like mimic these voices that were not like mine. And then obviously the things I write on my own, they're true. Like I write black characters and I tell very black stories. Some of them have to do with like the queer narrative, but it's real. It's like, that's what I'm very comfortable in. But I can also write white characters that are straight and live in middle America and be, and it'd be seamless. So that was a really very interesting piece of advice that I remember hearing and um, taking really seriously. But I, I guess I just wonder for you, because so much of what you write is about honesty uh -huh. and the way people deal with honesty. Uh -huh. uh, and some people can deal with it and some people can't. Uh -huh. uh, and I wonder where that comes from for you, because it, it seems like, it, based on the stuff of you as I've seen, is really specific to you. Yeah. Honesty is almost a story you're always telling. Yeah, and I think that just sort of comes from, because I feel like it takes energy to lie and I'm very lazy. So, and there's just the bluntness that I was sort of born with. And I don't know, it's just, it is my personality. Even my friends are very aware if you come to me for advice, it's gonna be very blunt, which I think Aziz sort of like took and ran with with the character of Denise. Um, I'm just a very honest person, but also I believe as a writer, for me, my job is to observe human behavior. And there's nothing more honest than that. Like if you're watching, if you're sitting at a, t if you're sitting at a restaurant 
and you're watching a couple on their first date, like the behavior is very honest. You know, it's they're shy, they're timid, they're nervous, they're awkward, there's silences, you know, there's a, a need to impress, you know, there's a, a, brav a bravado that the guy is ha having that he probably doesn't normally have or a, a sort of a timidness that the girl is pretending to have because she wants the guy to like her and thinks she's of a certain way. Like there's certain things that are happening at that table that is just honest. You know what I'm saying? Even though, even, even though it's not honest, they're sort of putting on their best foot for it, and there's an honesty in that, of wanting this person to like you. You know what I'm saying? Even though, but you, but you don't, but you wanna be that thing that they wanna like, even if that's not you. You know what I'm saying? Like, so all that stuff, like to me, there's, there's a truth in that. And, that. and as a writer, it's my job to tell the truth. That's my job, whatever that truth is. And sometimes people, you know, we, people differ in opinion. You know, it's like Gina prince Pythwood, for example, who was a person I used to work, work for, somebody I look up to. She believes that, you know, a writer should not only depict reality, but what reality could be. For me, I want to depict it in all of its ugliness and all of its beautifulness and let it live. And then we kind of sit back and look at it and make a decision on, for ourselves. But that doesn't make her opinion less valid than mine or my opinion less valid than hers. That's just my approach to it. Like, I want to be completely honest about the scene. Like, I don't want to say, well, this is how I would like for it to go. No, how would it really be? What would it really look like? To me, that's more entertaining. Since you're talking about this, I'm thinking about Hello Cupid mm. and, and just that whole opening over the dating and, and well, you know, why would a white guy? Why would a black guy? I'm sorry. Why would a white guy go out with a red bone? Mm -hmm. We can date a white woman. It's like mm -hmm. <laughs> that. That kind of constant bluntness. Yeah. Or con I should, no, no. It's not blunt. It's directness. You right. Know, because these people aren't trying to hurt each other, but they end up doing it anyway, which right. is the, the fun of it. Right, right, yeah. And I think with Hello Cupid, you know, working with Ashley Blaine Featherson, who's a close friend of mine, who's now on Dear White People, she's in the movie and in the series now, as Joelle. But like, she sat down, she's like, hey, I want to do a web series, I want to do something. And I was like, and I think for me, as a writer, I'm always like, okay, what's the twist? What's the, what's the thing that's interesting? Or what's the ugly truth we're ignoring? Because she said, because I said to her, I said, let's talk, well, what's your dating life like? And she's like, well, it's tough, and it's this and that. But I think that we were sort of sort of mowing around was the fact that she's a dark-skinned African-American woman. I was like, okay, that's a, that's a thing that we want to, let's not ignore that elephant in the room. And so, and then I also comp I combined that with a conversation I had with somebody who said, yeah, I was sort of dating on a dating app and I swapped my picture out. This is a black guy, swapped his picture out with a white guy and got a different response. So I said, let's tweak that and have it be like about a light-skinned black girl that you swap your picture with and see what kind of response you get. And is it an ugly truth that we might dive into? Maybe, but that's interesting. I think it could be entertaining. I think it also can be challenging to the audience, black and white. And to me, that was fascinating. And that also, that's, that stemmed from a history, but also stemmed from influences of us watching school days or even a different world. You know, look at Kim, you look well, at Well, talk about Whitley how much a different world means meant to you. I mean, everything, you know, it's like, it, it changed the course of my life, watching that show. And I was a young person. I was a kid. I wasn't even near college age or any of that kind of stuff, but it was aspirational in a sense. Because even if you think about the weight of that, of like the audacity to what to do a TV show that takes place at a fictitious HBCU. And this is before school days, by the way, this show. Yeah, it was. And I know they, people kind of say, well, they came around the same time, but it was before. A couple years before school days. Yeah, day. exactly. And that's sort of like, because obviously you have some similar actors appearing in both and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was just, it was like, I didn't even know what HBCU was, you know? I didn't know, you know, and then to see, you know, these cool, interesting, attractive, well-dressed, smart characters that were well-rounded. I mean, Whitley is like such a wonderful character. She's, to me, I think one of the greatest television characters of all time. And a real original. A real original. I mean, and also too, loosely based on Susan Fells Hill. I mean, if you meet Susan Fells, you're like, oh, okay. So, um, who is a woman who is, um, you know, well, she's actually biracial, the character Whitley isn't. But, you know, it's like this, it's the fair-skinned, you know, girl, debutante, you know, Southern Belle, comes from my old money and sort of has a certain way of being that you didn't really see on television. And then you have but a- she's also black. I mean, she's also black, which is, you know, important. But also you have a Kimberly Reese who comes from a middle-class, working-class family, and she's majoring in, you know, She's, she's trying to be a doctor, you know, and her father's a cop. And, they, and they, those two kind of black women being roommates and what comes out of that 
You know what I'm saying? And then also the Freddie character, which was way ahead of her time. You know, she was an environmentalist. She was a hippie. She actually was depicted as a biracial, you know, person. And how her mom came in to visit and what that was like. And also in the Ron character, which I really liked, you know, with his dad being a car salesman and him wanting to be a musician and him sort of like being sort of a bit of a fuck up, but trying to, he, he was an artist on the show. And then that was Dwayne, who's like an engineer, but still cool and still fly. Like, it's sort of like, they, it's like these characters were so, they were so human, you could smell them through the TV screen. And the shocking thing is that it was a network television show. Network, on NBC. the number one network following, I guess we can still say this, the number one TV show of all time. It's a really tricky thing for me, like this whole situation, because without the Cosby show in a different world, like I don't know if I would be sitting here right now. It's hard to take it away. I mean, you know, it's funny because with everything that's going on, <laughs> classic, like TV One has this like Cosby show marathon on right now, so we know where they stand, but <laughs> it's, why, you know. Why, whatever do you mean? <laughs> so this morning, my girlfriend like, you know, woke up, woke up went downstairs and she, she, um, she, put, she put it on, you know, it's always fun to watch TV One. She turned it on and, and it was on, and I came downstairs, and you know, and they sort of, and it was actually a clip show episode, you know, where they're sort of toxicing with Elvin, and they're talking about all of Sandra's past boyfriends, and just sort of different stories. There's some of these clips, but it's just, there's something about that show that feels like home. There's something about it, like to see, to be, because I was, because it, it debuted uh, the year I was actually born, which is crazy, but to watch the show and to see Rudy, who was a normal black little girl who reminded me very much of myself, who spoke to her parents with respect, who dressed a lot like I dressed with little, you know, with the barrettes and the matching outfits and, you know. You referenced in the opening of 20s, the whole Rudy thing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's sort of interwoven into my, the fabric of my life, you know, it's, it, it was always there. You know, and um, and watching that show with my family, you know, even though our family looked very different from the family that was before us, you know, we were in the south side of Chicago, living with my grandmother, you know, in her basement because we couldn't afford to. My mom had divorced, and so she couldn't afford to to take care of us on her own. So we were living with my grandmother, single mom, my aunt, and my sister, and me, watching the Cosby Show, seeing a reflection of ourselves, well, seeing the best in us. You know what I'm saying? So you know, and it's like Felicia Rashad is a queen among men. Like the, the way she delivers lines, like the timing, the look, the, I mean, like they were, you know, they, I just, I just think they saved us. They made us feel like um, we were human. So look, it, you know, it's interesting because one night I was like, oh, I wanna watch an episode of The Cosby Show. Couldn't find it on Hulu, couldn't find it on Netflix, couldn't even buy it on iTunes. But if I wanna fi find Annie Hall, I can watch that. If I want to watch Rosemary's again, Baby, why, I can find that. Again, whatever do you mean by this? <laughs> so. It's funny because so much of this gets back to wh what do you ask yourself about what you do? Mm -hmm. And you have to, even for yourself as a fan, you're saying you have to be honest. Right. You can't pretend that this didn't mean something to you. Right. Yeah. That's not part of the fundament of your being. Yeah. And the aspirational example that it offered and you know, before that, it was Norman Lear shows, which right. is a bunch of white guys writing about black people arguing. All Absolutely. The time. And and it's a really interesting thing because I'll tell you once: a major director told me the greatest natural actor he ever met was Bill Cosby. Mm, I, I I would agree. I get that. And so it's it's this, it's this weird thing because so many people wanted to build their lives based around that, you wanted to become a writer, I'm guessing, based around that. Oh, yeah, you. yeah. You know, it's interesting because that great Tupac documentary about called Resurrection, where he talks about wanting to live in the TV screen, because he talked about watching different strokes for his, his, his generation, right? And he says he would watch them, and they would be, you know, happy, and everything would be great. It's like, I could relate so much to that, because that's how I felt watching A Different World, Family Matters, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Like, I would look at that and go, yeah, I want to escape this reality that I'm in and be in there. You know, like, even this feature I'm writing right now, like, I literally have a character say, if it weren't for the movies, I wouldn't know what to dream about. So, for me, that's what television was. I always say I grew up in a two-parent household, my mother and the television. Um, because I spent a lot of time not just watching it, you know, but really digesting it, 
and absorbing it. Um, and then I became a student of it as a child. I would watch, I, I was like, okay, these are the shows that are on right now that I like, like a Cosby show, A Different World, Family Matters, all that kind of stuff. But then I would stay up later and watch Nick at Night and watch the Marie Tyler Moore show and watch Maude and watch Rhoda and All in the Family. Um, because I was like, these shows existed long before these other ones, but they're still relevant and funny and entertaining. So what is, it, what is in the DNA of these TV shows that maybe someday I'll grow up to write because I don't want to just write a show that's fun now, but something that'll still be fun and interesting and entertaining and relevant 20 years from now? Well, all these shows we're talking about are these shows that broke the mold. I mean, yeah. they're all shows that did something incredibly different. Cosby yeah. Show had a nuclear black family, and they were all professionals, mm -hmm. you know, living in a dream house in Brooklyn. That Absolutely. never happened before. Right. And then I still don't think people understand how radical a show A Different World was. I agree. I think they don't get it. They don't. It should be on, like, in the top 20 shows of all time, it should be on those lists. The That's fact that it's, like, it, the fact that it's sort of something, and, and I get it, it's in the shadow of the Cosby show. I understand that, and that came first. But that show, I just think, I mean, Debbie Allen, Susan Fells, Gina prince Bythewood was one of her first staff writing gigs. Yvette Lee Bowser was working under Susan Fells. It's like, it, it began so many careers. Like, if it weren't for that show, you wouldn't have Living Single. You wouldn't have Love and Basketball. If you didn't have Living Single, you wouldn't have Friends. That's real. Don't let it, don't, don't get Yvette started. Don't get Yvette started. This could come, become a very cold afternoon. I know, this is about the, we, we going in. We're like, you know. But, I mean, I, I feel like in a lot of these shows we're talking about, we, the Mary Tyler Moore show is a show, mm -hmm. it had to be a fight where the network didn't want to put the show on because the idea of it being a single woman, she, there had to be something wrong with her because right. originally she wanted to They were she was going to be, be divorced, divorce but yeah. they thought that people in the world would think that she had divorced Dick Van Dyke and who in the world would do that. So well, they, they thought they'd think she was a fallen woman if she was a divorcee. Ah, that's interesting. So th that's th there was morality based on that, too. That's true. And, and I'm so happy that it wasn't divorced because then her ex-husband would have been a character and that would have been a thing. Like, to me, I love the fact that she had made a choice to still be single. That's what I think is the anchor of the show. And, and, then, and also, to me, it's, it's such an interesting, because, yes, it's a workplace comedy, but it's also sort of a chosen family comedy. Like, Murray was like her brother, Rhoda was like her sister, Phyllis was like her crazy aunt, you know what I'm saying? And obviously Lou was sort of like a father figure. It really was very much this family that she, and Ted was like her crazy uncle, you know what I'm saying? It's like these very interesting characters that she chose to be around. She chose to spend all her time with those people. And it was almost, it was very telling in terms of as a young person watching that, understanding like, oh, okay. Because that's also a really great episode where her father is, is, is well, you meet her both of her parents, which are played beautifully by really interesting um, actors, but to me, that was just very interesting in the writing. And in watching those shows, that been the shows that preceded but influenced those shows, because mm -hmm. Jay Sandridge, who directed a lot of the Cosby it was shows, phenomenal, directed yeah. all those other shows. Oh yeah, yeah, huge, 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 huge. Like I, I've always been obsessed with him, and also Jimmy Burroughs as well. You know, later who, who would go on to obviously direct many, many things. And but both of these guys had dads who were directors. You know, Jay oh. Sandridge's dad. Mark Sanders directed Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. I didn't know that. And Jimmy Burroughs' dad was Abe Burroughs, who directed Broadway plays. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, because they're both, I mean, I mean, they literally laid the blueprint for what sitcom television is yeah, and Burroughs looks like. Burroughs every episode of Taxi and then all of Will and Grace. Yes, and Will and Grace is one of my, my all-time favorite sitcoms, and I think I learned a lot about... Watching Will and Grace taught me a lot about rhythm and comedy, and that... It's, it's, it really is music. And I, I, I read somewhere that James sometimes would direct with his eyes closed um, because he would want to hear it. And if, it and, if, and if one beat was off, he would know, okay, you have to go rewrite that joke. Like, and just reading that was like very interesting to me because that really taught me a lot, um, particularly in comedy. There is a rhythm to it. And it has to, you know, if, if somebody falls off beat, the joke doesn't land. But your comedy, if we're talking about rhythm, is the flow, if you're part of me for saying that, is very mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. And and it's y the voice of you and your generation applied to that kind of rhythm. It's True. Totally different. It's almost like, forgive me for saying this, it's, but it's very much like the Warren G kind of flow. Yeah. It's, it's more melodic than. Yeah. 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 Than yeah. 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 And I think for me, and I still like to find it, you know, it's like I definitely have a voice, but I'm, I definitely feel like I'm still finding my voice and fine tuning it for sure. Because I'm thinking about that. Great monologue in, in 20s, which ends with, 
But it comes down to the Wiz and the Wizard of Oz. Mm. I'm sorry, I prefer the white one. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's yeah. That to me is all of that's you. It's honest. It's direct, but it's also melodic. I mean, because true. It, it sort of slaps you the very end, like oh. Yeah, yeah, true. And that definitely comes from me studying, you know, like old school TV shows in terms of just sort of like, but up, up, boom. You know what I'm saying? So, but I do sort of remix it a little bit for me because I do want to feel conversational. Um, but I think. A big thing for me is I do like a, a tennis, a back and forth, you know, especially when I'm writing two characters. You So to me, it's sort of like, especially they're characters that know each other well, I try to keep that in mind. I try to say, like, when you're talking to someone you're very friendly with, you can, it's like, it's just, it's very quick. And it's very sort of, there's a shorthand. And I do like to write characters that are have known each other for a long time because I like to write shorthand conversations. Um, and I like to get information. I don't, because the hardest thing is to get exposition out, but I think there's always ways to to explain all these all these two people are sisters, or these two people work together, or these two people used to hate each other. Now they don't anymore. Because I think you can always get it out in the dialogue. Um, and I think it's just a matter of packing a big punch. And I also like to do it in terms of like a page. Like, I like I'm like, okay, I want to establish their sisters, and they have different fathers on this one page. And I think there's a way to do that, like in a couple couplets. And, and uh, and, and that, that to me is always the exciting part. You know, it might be, that's always fun. You know, like, cause somebody could say like, oh, like how did he know we would have different fathers? Like, well, look at you, have, look at your, your, your curl pattern. Of course you have a different father than I do or something like that. Like that alone sort of like that kind of thing is very, that's always fun to like find that and put that in a character's mouth. I was thinking too, as you were talking about that, there's a section of, I think maybe it's episode three of, of uh, Hello Cupid where, the back and forth of the text messages mm. at a certain point they just overlap right and which is all those things you're talking about mm-hmm. there's a rhythm it comes into but his rhythm is very different from her rhythm absolutely yeah that was a really fun thing to write i mean and also it's a thing i also enjoy even though i love writing dialogue between women especially particularly african-american women but writing the thing about this young woman texting with this guy who she's sort of tricking because he thinks that she's this light-skinned girl and she's not and they're vibing all that kind of stuff to me that's also really exciting that dance of flirtation um and also there was an added layer to it because she knew she was misleading him so i had to have that layer in my brain as well and also she's asking herself honestly should, should be about should who she is yeah should i even be, again, continue this always, is a subtext. Yes, yes, exactly. And to me, that kind of stuff is always a wonderful challenge. You know, it's like, what is the conflict? Whenever I mentor young writers and I'm looking at their material, I think they often forget it's like, how much conflict can you layer onto a scene? So it's like, that scene was really fun to write because it was, it was about, first of all, you have the element of like, sort of early dating and texting and what that is. There's nerves there, there's, there's added bravado there, and there's shyness there. But then the element that she knows that he thinks she looks like someone else, and she's also guilty about engaging in this conversation, pretending to be something, someone that she isn't. Um, and that he's also, and the weird thing about him is, he is innocent, but in a weird way, the audience is almost mad at him because like, oh, so you talking to her because she light skin, that's why you like her. So it's like that thing is sort of happening. So to me, I like, it's sort of like, how many instruments can one give me to play this one song? And oftentimes new writers have, okay, so he has a violin and she has a drum. And it's like, that's a boring song. It's like, add more instruments to that, that song, and you'll have a symphony. So, no violin and drums. You don't like John Mellencamp. OK. Ah. Um, but in that, that sequence, and especially here, you disentangle it here, it made me think of Tootsie, mm. where there's all these things going on. So great. You know, but you see what I'm talking mm-hmm. about? I mean, mm-hmm. that idea of truth. Yeah. But, him wanting to be the best woman he can be, even though he's not a woman. Right. But he also wants to be the best actor he can be. Oh, so great. Such and, a great and movie. And people are buying into it, but he's also trying to make them better, but he's also hating himself for doing it. Right. That, that's to me. And becoming a better man by being a woman. Yeah. Yeah, which is both interesting and condescending at the yeah, same time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But Fair enough. Fair enough. Sorry. sorry. Fair but enough. I, it, but in that section of Hello Cupid, I just thought, that's who you are. Mm. I mean, that's so much of you, and 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 that's early me. That's like, yeah, you know what I'm saying. That was me finding myself, you know, online. You know what I'm saying through a thing where I don't have a network, I don't have notes. You know, it's sort of me working with those actors and a and a, a director who also was very loose. The director was not like, okay, we all has to be this way. It was sort of like, let's let these words live. And so, for me, it's such a beautiful like early chapter. I think because it really is very pure, and it's me. But it, I look at that, and it's like, oh, that's me 
it's finding my voice, you know, because that's very different from the shy or even it's a reflection of 20s, you know what I'm saying? It's like those things that sort of grow, you know, as a writer with every, every project. I'm always trying to discover and find and fine tune and hone and, and watch things and study stuff and like, because there are certain movies or TV shows I'll go to and look at and study and, and try to take notes. Uh, I think of it as like being example, an athlete. What, what? Um, a show I really love and I'm obsessed with is a show called The Comeback, which was oh the, the, that short-lived, yeah. 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 Which I got Michael to, Beckett I was- King and Lisa Kudrow. I know, and I got to, one of the greatest gifts was to play a small part in season two. Um, like a journalist who's interviewing her and giving her a hard time, giving Valley Church a hard time. Um, so to be directed by Michael Patrick King and to be working with Lisa Goudreau was phenomenal. But that show to me is, is it's, it's the pinnacle of, you know, honest, blunt, writing, you know, and also a unique character. Valerie Cherish is such a phenomenal character. You know, if you haven't seen it, please go on HBO Go. You can find it. It's two seasons, and it's amazing. It's a big episode. Yeah, but here's the cool thing. It, it aired, the first season aired, and 10 years later, they did the second season because the first season has such a cult following that HBO decided to bring it back for a second season 10 years later. I mean, that's the kind of stuff, like, I want to, like, that's the thing, like, I wouldn't even care if it only, only lasts one season, but the fact, the, the validation of people have been talking about this one season so much that we're going to do a second season, even if it's 10 years later. Um, and, then I, and then I got to be a part of it. How cool is that? Because I was obsessed with it living in Chicago. It was still when I was in Chicago, and I was obsessing over it, and then cut two. Talk about that's the way God works. But that, that show is phenomenal to me. Um... Uh, and then in terms of movies, like I, I, a fun thing I tend to go back and visit a lot, which is crazy, is Boomerang. I really like that movie a lot, like in terms of like just, it's funny because there is this genre, which I give a hard time a lot because it's not my brand, but there's this genre of like, I call it pretty black people movies, <laughs> where they have very simple problems and... <laughs> Um, you just basically dissed the entire 90s, no, but please, go. No, 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 I disagree. No, 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 I'm talking about more relevant, more recent. Um, because, like, there, but there's something about that movie that captures what it means to be black, professional, hip, cool, sexy, have a friend. I mean, there's real moments in that movie. Like when, when David Allen Greer like asks him if he has sex with Angela, like at the pool hall, like it's a real moment. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and then when they all gather at Martin Lawrence's crib, like to me, like, you know, because Martin's character is trying to bring them back together, they're fighting over a girl and, and then the house is on fire. He's like, not the penthouse. Like there's just like so many like great moments in that movie. And then also too, I mean, to me, the casting is so inspired. You know, the fact that that's an early Holly Berry thing where, you know, where Robin Givens is the, you know, she's the get. You know what I'm saying? And then for the way the story turns and you don't expect it to, to go that way, you think, I mean, it, it was very revolutionary for, for like, for you to think like, oh, they're going to take this person who you think he's going to try to get and she's going to, you know, he's met his match, but they're going to wind up together. And the fact that they trick you and they've got this cute girl with a little funny, little short haircut and sweet face. And that's the girl. That, it's just, I think it's beautiful storytelling and it's so well done. But also I like revisiting Menace to Society a lot. Like that to me is such a phenomenal movie. Um, I can watch Boys in the Hood any day of the week, you know, do the right thing as an everyday or like, there's just like certain, and then also the novels watch movies like Welcome to the Dollhouse, which really kind of speak to, to me and, and I think are really interesting. So I just, I just anything that's sort of character, character, character and, and memorable scenes and memorable moments, I think kind of always hook me. Well, all these things you've been mentioning, if they have anything in common is that straightforwardness I was talking about. Yeah. You know, this not sort of contrived sit sitcom-y kind of thing. So yeah. people actually sort of saying what they think and doing damage. That's what all a Boomerang is. Yeah. You know, he can't hide what he is. And by the way, you know, the great thing about Boomerang is who's the guy who has a few throwaway lines as a male boy? Chris Rock. Come on. Come on. I mean, it's like, it's just great. Like, you can't, every, in Eartha Kitt and Rich Jones are like in the, you know what I'm saying? Like, what? Noah Van Peebles. Oh, yeah. I know. This is a short cameo, yeah. cameo talking about the nipple. It's like. Phenomenal. I, it just, and I think it also set off a generation of young people that made us kind of want to be professionals or like be fly and have a cool apartment. You know what I'm saying? Like it definitely made folks go, yeah, I want to go out. Like that set the tone for the best man and all that kind of stuff like that. Cause it was like, it's us always chasing that. Like, like the whole Marcus thing. And, and I mean, but also that, that trio of like him, Martin Lawrence and David Allen Greer at a table ordering, like just, you know, and then like talking about the, the, the asparagus tips, why don't you, you know, it's like, there's just, it, to me, I, I, I always hope, I'm always chasing those guys in terms of trying to like make something that people will still be talking about 
like years and years and years later. It's so interesting you're saying this too because when that movie failed, mm -hmm. because the only reason, that, and I keep thinking about this, a critic, and I'm not even going to say this is, but somebody sure. was still writing today mentioned, hmm. how can this world exist with all these black people? And I think, are you serious? Wow, wow, wow. Batman is set in Gotham City, which is New York, and there's not a single black person. Wow. The Batman sequels that summer said there's not a single black person in this, and that doesn't seem to be science fiction somehow mm, or another. Yeah. As but it was also on purpose, you know, because that, if you think about it, if you look at Boomerang, it is sort of this sort of like, sort of like no, imaginary right. world that, that obviously well, Eddie the, a white made girl's a waitress for God's sake. I, I know. mean, that's how it's like, it's like, and, that's, that. and I'm like picking up on that right now. Like, that's so interesting. So this alternate universe where everybody's Sadly, black, that is an alternate everybody's blind. But even think about when they go into the, the place, uh, they're looking at suits and the white guy like gives them a hard time. So there's a little bit of social commentary there, you know, and um, because they are. White people exist in the movie for, for social commentary. Yeah. Like the white waitress talking about the asparagus spears versus the tips. I know. So whenever a white person shows up in Boomerang, you go, here we go. Right. It's not going to be good. Right. It's not going to be good. That's so interesting. That's dope. I, I yeah. can't like, not sit here and bring up uh, shit black girls say. Oh, my which gosh. Which makes me tear up every time I think oh about that. Oh, my gosh. That was crazy. It is the greatest thing in the history of the internet. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I tell people about this thing. It's basically a series of non sequiturs. I mean, that's the thing. And I think, again, this is me, again, very early finding my voice and being very just sort of bold. But it's all punchlines. Oh, yeah. That's why I think it was really fun to do. And I literally wrote that in my apartment in the Valley, saw the thing with the white girl say. I mentioned but I actually mentioned it to a few friends of mine. Like, oh, what if it was a black girl you're say? you the satire of, I'm sorry, it's not funny. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. It, but a lot of my friends were like, oh, because I was, I was texting people like one-liners and things like that just for shits and gigs. And they were like, you should actually do it. And I was like, well, where am I going to find a black dude to get in a dress, cut to Billy Sorrell. I was like, happy to do it. Um, and uh, and no, but I called him, like, and he, like, got his shit together and got a crew together. And, like, I literally, I was just, like, tell, I'm like, will you say whatever? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was giving it to him over the phone, and he was, like, doing it. And, like, we had no idea. We just kind of wanted to have a talk about social commentary on just, just to kind of like, do our version of it and for people to take it. And then, obviously, we, it's our fault. People then kept running with it, and there was something everybody said. But it was a really cool moment for me and a, a bit of, you know, definitely validation. Like, you know, Reginald Hudlin, like, messaged me on Facebook about it, like, Chris Rock and me. It was nuts. Like, it was, and that was sort of a first thing where people were saying, oh, you have something. There's whatever you're doing over there, like, it's interesting and it's funny. And I received that and really appreciated it. I just thought it was so interesting. Is for me, and I've talked with you about this just a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. it's about the kind of self awareness that people of color have to have. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of taking something that, as far as I'm concerned, is like Canadian satire, you can do that if you will, mm -hmm. so shit girls say, which is just not funny. Hmm. Well, what are you saying shit girls? You said The original, <gasps> that you're doing the parody of. It's just like, oh, I guess it's supposed to be funny. Well, I mean, I think for, the, well, here's the interesting thing is, there's a thing about when you say something white, there's this sort of idea that that means all. Right. So for me, I well, want to be the very mainstream. Forgive my imprecision. Mainstream, whatever. I think I'd like to make things specific to us. But yeah. And so this, and this goes back to where we started, which yeah. is you taking the modern family right. premise and making that about you. Yeah. So taking this thing that's sort of like vague and kind of a construct, mm -hmm. but using it as a way to comment on what comedy is versus something that comes from you, but also just this idea of this. And that's really old, old school comic rhythm. Yeah, yeah. It's just this and this oh, yeah. and this. Mm -hmm. Delete, delete. Yeah, delete. yeah, like delete, delete, delete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but also, too, it goes back to, I think, my observation, like, you know, and being hyper aware, you know, and I'm even. See, but that's what I talked to you just about two weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, I'm always, yes, I'm always observing human behavior, but I'm really always observing my people. You know, I'm fascinated by us. We, I am like we're a phenomenal group of p human beings. Like that, we we walk through the world differently. If you see if you see two black women walking down the street, it, it's it's art in motion. I say that all the time. <laughs> it's real. It, it, it's, am I disagreeing? No, no, I am not. You shouldn't. I, I have I have too many sisters at home. I, I have know, six women I who will beat it. me into a pulp yes. if I said something wrong. But again, this idea of having to. I think as a person of color, especially in the creative world, there's a double sort of almost a mirror effect of awareness you have to have because every time you walk into a room, mm -hmm. so often you might be the only person of color in that room. Oh, absolutely. And to be a person of color in that room with a different sexual orientation, mm -hmm. so 
that doubles the gaze. Sure. And also doubles your awareness, does it not? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the thing is, is for me, I look at it as sort of a superpower. I don't want. It looks like having Spidey sense. Oh yeah, you know, it's like that's that's my cape, that's my armor. You know what I'm saying? Like, and so because the truth is, what I think rather than being ashamed of it, but it's more about oh, people are fascinated by me, these things that make me different, because I'm a woman, because I'm black, because I'm gay. Okay, cool. Let me use that to my advantage. If you're so fascinated by it, okay, I'm gonna write about it, and you're gonna have one inquire. You're gonna be entertained by it. You're gonna be drawn in. So let's make some money together off of it. You know what I'm saying? It's like versus, you know, I think to me, it's like, you know, even some of these um, acting opportunities I've gotten, um, I am a different version of an actor in that I'm, I don't know how to come in and squeeze myself into the role. I'm going to come in and give you the role as I would do it. And if you dig that, cool. If not, that's fine too. And I think in doing that and walking in with to Aziz and Allen's, you know, to their sort of lair, they were like, okay, that's a completely different version of the role we had in mind, but it's more interesting than we had. And I think a part of that is because I'm queer, is because I'm black, you know what I'm saying? They knew they wanted a girl, got that covered, but the black queer part, they didn't, I don't think thought up. And so I'm not, that, that's not lost on me. So for me, I'm gonna walk in and give you this and go like, if this is if you if you fuck with it, let's roll. And they did, and I think rightfully so. But I feel like, please, yes. I brought this up last week. I, that, I said that basically oh, yeah, no, mm -hmm. everybody in the show has kind of a spidey sense, because if you're Indian American or right. an African American woman, mm -hmm. you're always aware of the way that you're being judged in a room, because especially when you walk in, and the show's been about that so often. Mm -hmm. and and. It even extends to your Thanksgiving episode, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is having to bring that into the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think for me, in, in, in being welcomed into you know co-writing it with Aziz, I think it was about how specific could, could I be, how specific could I get, how black could I get, how female could I get, and Aziz was like, "Have at it, like go at it," and so. That's what I really tried to do. And also, too, I really wanted to be very true to my story. And that's the thing. I think the more broad people are, like, the more boring. You know, it's like the more specific you are, oddly enough, the more people can see themselves. They can relate to it in a way. Because I chose to be super vulnerable about my memories, about my experiences, being at a table with, you know, black women of three different generations and hearing them speak about the world. And that's how I learned to walk through the world, how to how to walk out with you know my chest out and like you know and and, and with my head held high and, and and not afraid to talk shit no matter where I'm at, like that's what that's what you get at that table. And I think to have the opportunity to write about that and then to to tell my story about what it means to come out to a, a group of people like that, you know, which is also a little complicated. Uh, that was a wonderful opportunity to show that because I don't think we've seen that before. And I think that goes back to, again, breaking the mold. But I'll, I was almost doing that without, that wasn't even on purpose. Telling my, I didn't realize that I, we were doing something revolutionary by telling my story. But unfortunately, a lot of stories that look like mine aren't really being told in that way. So it was a wonderful opportunity. And I think for me, I think I said this to you too last week, it was like, it became a tribute to black women, honestly. Um, and a tribute to my mother, and a tribute to my grandmother, and a tribute to all my aunts and all that kind of stuff. Because, and it's also a tribute to coming out and surviving it as a person, not only as a queer person, but as a queer person of color, which is another layer. It just is. Um, and I think, I hope what people got from it is that, you know, it is a superpower. You are stronger because of it. Um, and, you know, and I stand tall at the end of it, you know? Well, I told you one of the greatest things I'd ever seen was that scene in the kitchen mm -hmm. where you and, and your mom were talking. You're not even looking at each other. Right. I mean, there's so much physical language going on. I, I just, 
that's one of the most remarkable pieces of writing I've ever seen. Oh, wow, and it's so you. well acted, too. And talk about doing that scene. Wow. And, and thank you so much for calling attention to it, because I think, obviously, the, the, the scene that gets a lot of attention is the coming out scene and some of the, the, the scenes at the dinner table. But to me, and I'm so happy, because that scene could have easily wound up on the cutting room floor. But the scene... Really? Could it? It could have, sure. You know, um, because technically, it doesn't necessarily move the story forward. Um, it sort of adds to the story, but the scene he's talking about is when is the scene after myself and my mother, played by Angela Bassett, are in the kitchen washing dishes after I brought my first girlfriend home, and uh, the ta it was very awkward. The ta it was very quiet, and uh, she and the well, character she also includes her going after you for like. What, she's basically accusing you of having having sex on the Thanksgiving yeah, table. Yeah, like she's like saying you're making like you can be lesbian if you want to, but like don't be disrespectful. It's still my house, and I saw you making eyes and all that kind of stuff, which is a real conversation that t probably takes place with every black person if they're gay with their parent. Um, but it for real happened for me, and and that's the thing. It's like you can be gay if <laughs> you know you're good, but. And I think that to me is what that scene represents. You know, it's about well, okay, you can have you can have a girl over here, but like, don't be touchy feely. Like, don't act like y'all gay. You know, like just sit, act, just be friends. Like, sit there like every other like gay person has in the history of gay black people, and, and acting like y'all weren't together, but you live together and you have a dog together. Y'all just cool. You know what I'm saying? We don't know where the child comes from, but you know, y'all are together and it's fine. You know what I'm saying? That's what the hope is, is like that you can be gay, but for it not to affect me. It's like going to therapy, but telling lies. It's sort of like you have to kind of, and so, and that, but that is the process. That's what it looks like. So I appreciate you like really taking in that scene because to me, that is what I wanted the episode to feel like. Like the, the coming out is just that, a process. And also, because there's so many big laughs that seem to come before it, mm -hmm. that to me is just, to have a scene between two color characters of color that's as much based on gesture as language mm -hmm. on whatever Netflix is, is I think a landmark moment. Mm. And, and that it got on, I don't know how it got on, but I just thought it's a tribute to your acting skill. Oh, thank you. To, well, please, don't, don't <laughs> let me see it here by myself. And I don't want to say it's some way to make you proud. I want you to take pleasure in having done that because mm. so much of what you do is about finding a way to give pleasure to people, mm. you know, just by directness. And and there's what's so great about what you do is if it's really simple. Your characters don't call each other by the name all the time, mm. which is which is a TV thing. Well, you know, Mary, I was yeah. thinking, Mary, that you should go down to the car, Mary. So crazy you say that. It's so crazy you say that, because I'll reveal a little something, something about this feature I'm writing. Um, I don't want to reveal the characters' names until the end of the movie. Because people don't, talk, don't do that when they talk. Yeah. Like, I, have, I, I, give it, I give them nicknames in the action. Like I'll say for the purpose of the story, we'll call her Queen. We'll call him Slim. You know, it's like, and the funny thing, because it's, again, it's me, it's my bluntness, my laziness, whatever you want to call it, but it's like, I just... I don't know, I wanted to always feel honest, you know? I wanted to feel truthful, you know? I wanted to feel like a punch in the gut, you know? That that the pain goes away very quickly. You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah, like that's, that's because, I don't know, I just wanted to feel like a face with no makeup on it. Yeah, and, and but if you're a real student, and clearly you are of television, it's the thing that really drives me crazy, especially the farther Ugh. back you go, the more they do it. So crazy, yeah. And I have an, yeah, I have an, uh, an aversion to it. Yeah, so I think that's something you're definitely picking up on because, and then me being very, mind you, it's a bold choice to do that in the script, but it's something I'm trying, and I'm, my hope is if once, hopefully, we get the movie made, that people may not even be aware of it until they hear the characters' names at the end and go, oh, shit, we didn't know, we didn't know their names. You know, so we'll see, but I'm trying. I just thought, just have been a fan of yours for a long time, and I was saving this, hoping I have a chance to sit with you. Please come to, please come to my radio show at some point. Too. Yes. I mentioned to you when I first met you. I would love that. But I've always thought that was the greatest thing, that these characters don't call themselves out. Yeah. And I just thought, that's somebody who's really learned from the example of even the best TV show at some point. Well, you know... Yeah, NCIS. Yes, the name I is. know. I know. It's like, <laughs> how can I like do the opposite of bad television writing? Well, even good television writing. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It comes in. Cause, yeah, because TV was based on this thing that until you know platforms.
there's an act break, so you have to constantly remind people they're watching. Yeah. Yeah. Or if they're just tuning in, who they were seeing. Oh, yeah. Or even like the second episodes of television, you're resetting the pilot. Yes. Which is really pilot basically does, you should forget about the pilot. I know. That's what I believe, too. It's hard. It depends on where you're at. Um, most of great pilots, most TV shows that are great shows had terrible pilots. True. But some TV shows, one of my, you know what my, one of my favorite pilots, though, is? It's Martin. It's a great pilot. It is a great pilot. Because it doesn't feel like a pilot. But it, it, it actually feels like his stand-up sort of bent into a TV show. Yeah. It does not feel like yeah, a but pilot. But the rest of the show is not like that, though. Yeah, no, no. But I think, you know, and I think, and I know that show sort of burned out a little bit, but if you look at the first three seasons, it's a wonderful combination of, the like... The first season, before you can almost see him collapsing from exhaustion by the end of the right, season. Right, 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 right. But that first season is, like... It's phenomenal. I think I think Atlanta though has a really strong pilot too. I think they did a really good job of like kind of figuring out that balance. It's but it's a it's a rare thing. It's a rare thing. It's but even hard. If you the pilot it's not like the rest of the show. Well, for mean, Atlanta, yeah, 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 yeah. And then yeah, they all feel different in a way. Obviously, there's a through line, but they feel different. Yeah, but that's kind of the, that pilot, and that's for the most part. He, that's the exception that proves the rule. Yeah. You think about all these other shows. You think about the pilot for All in the Family, but basically they were calling each other by their names all the time. Yeah. You got spunk. I hate spunk. I can't. That's the moment they always show from that show. I can't stand that moment. I know. It's very. It's a very TV esque moment. Um, the show's yeah. so good. You basically forget that until. Yeah, you, you let it, it go. Up. You let it. Li- I, one of my favorite is, is you know Rhoda like washing the window like she's, she's preparing the, par- the apartment for herself and only to find that someone has invaded it. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, no, no. You got to get out. But yeah. what I was so much fun about watching your stuff, too, is watching the casting mm. and watching the tension in the room as they're like arguing in that bathroom trying to figure out what to do with that tampon. Mm-hmm. The tampon episode. That that's, was a tampon that's, scene. I you know. Gotta t- you've got to talk. To tell I mean, you know, and hopefully we're going to try to get twins on the air for y'all. Hopefully. We'll see. Hopefully, strong. Please, prayers up. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, talking about truthfulness and having conversations with them um, and also be observing and being a student. Of black women saying like yeah like my mom was like no tampons what no that's that's what girls who are out here getting you know being fresh, you know, <laughs> pads are for the good wholesome girls you know and so that was like you know my household you know what I mean so it's like oh all I know is what I'm raised that's you know it's your mother is the person that sets that tone for you so and then I would talk to other black women they're like oh yeah I don't wear I don't figure out how to use tampons I was in college or like yeah my mom only had tampon pads in the house you know so but then white girls are like oh, I used a tampon when I was 14 he was like well okay well, that's interesting um <laughs> so it's like cultural stuff like having those conversations to me if, if I'm hearing that conversation and my girlfriend can attest to it that's a winding up in something like that's a scene like I'm writing that into something so and that obviously is, is still in the pilot episode of uh, 20s and as I continue to change it or develop it like that to me will always live you know because it's just so and it also look and some black girls like oh no that wasn't me it's like okay fine but it's a conversation now like that's the thing that people that you're going to be forced to engage in because I'm calling attention to it but and also too I can make it intimate you know, and then and that was again my voice and joking around that she was like the white girl says to them, I can't believe you guys don't know how to use tampons. And then she said, I can't believe you guys don't bless your food. So it's about it's like how do you play on the culturalness of it, you know? And that's what I'm always trying to do. I'm always trying to figure out like what's a what's a joke, what's a one liner, but what's a what's a a, a a substantial one liner. What's more fun for you, writing one liners or actually building up to this setup? Because one liners and having them land is mm-hmm. a deceptively hard thing to oh, do. Oh, yeah. And that, which is why, for me, shit bless girls say is so astonishing because every single <laughs> line lands. You, 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 When your tear ducts are exhausted from laughing <laughs> so much, there's still another one to come? There's still another one to come? What's more satisfying for you as a, as a writer? Um, I do enjoy one-liners. I like writing them. They're really fun. Um, but for me, the trick is always sort of, okay, <laughs> I don't want a one-liner to take away from a character. You know, and sometimes I'll do, sometimes I'll in a first draft, I'll just kind of have something fun because I want to try it. Kind of a placeholder? Yeah, you know, but then it's sort of like, okay, well, who is this character? Would she say that? You know, and, um, and uh, it's interesting because I just wrote like literally like a weird couplet of between these two characters playing with this feature. And, and I was like, I don't know if these characters would say that, but it's interesting to me. Like she literally refers to him, she calls him a motherfucker. And he's like, he's like, why, why I gotta be a motherfucker? I'll just treat you to dinner. And he, she's like, yeah, it costs 17 bucks. And he's like, 
but so if I took you to Red Lobster, I wouldn't be a motherfucker? She's like, no, if you took me to Red Lobster, you'd be a nigga. He's like, you say it like it's an insult. <laughs> so that was like a thing I was doing back and forth. So I'm like, again, so that's something I'm ri I've written, but I have to make sure that fits the character. And it may not, so it may not live. But that was something I sort of got into a riff that I was writing. I was sort of like, okay, okay, okay. Like, again, the cultural thing. I was like, and these are two black people. So it's like, but that says something about him. That says something about her. But it, so, so sometimes through one-liners, I can kind of figure out, like, what she, because I keep on like, what she calling, motherfucker? Like, but I like the fact that he's, like, saying, like, you calling me a nigga is not an insult. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like things like that. Sometimes the words help me to understand the characters. Yeah. So sometimes it's back and forth. So writing one-liners and, and those little couplets and stuff like that is really fun, but it kind of helps me to understand, like, who the people are. So I'm sure the one thing you've learned is that, again, it's really hard to have a series of one-liners land yeah. and not be disruptive, to keep right. this thing moving forward. Right. That's really hard to do, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing, it's like, cause, and I, do, I try not to get too caught up in them, but I I love putting a couple of like that in the midst of like a very you know serious scene. So it's like, okay, it's a bit of a breather and gives it a little bit of character. Um, and, um, and, and for that p purpose of that scene, they sort of, they need to be bickering a little bit because something's about to happen. But I hope that people then kind of go, also, I want to make people go, oh, okay, this is the movie I'm in. Okay, what, what's this? And, you know, they sort of debate about skinny Luther versus fat Luther and all that kind of stuff. Like, so it's like, you know, and her position is like, you know, I like, you know, it's, it's just like little, I just like playing with it. I just, it's, it's like, I'm like sitting at a piano, you know what I mean? I enjoy those sort of things, like, and, and pushing the envelope and, and, and like, who, like, and the fact that, like, he's a fat Luther guy, she's a skinny Luther girl, you know? And, um, and what does that say about them? You know what I'm saying? It's funny, it's silly, it's goofy, I enjoy it. And yet it matters. I have to ask you, do you want to <laughs> direct this? I do not. I Why? don't. I have somebody in mind. But You're only looking down and playing with the drawstring on your pants. Ah, so no. Look me in the eye. Why do you not want to direct this? Because here's the thing. Stop playing with your drawstring. I, I don't get down like that anymore. I don't have to do it all. I think that's where sometimes folks make, they, they trip up. It's like, let me get in a particular lane and run my race as best as I can and then pass the baton to somebody who can run the rest of it really well for me. Because trying to do the, oh, written, directed, stuff like, that's not my game. It's like, I want to write a really dope script, and I want a really dope person to come in and elevate it and take it to the next level. And I want actors to come in and, like, find these characters and bring things to it that I couldn't even imagine. I'm a fan of the trifecta. Even it was almost a little uncomfortable for me for Thanksgiving, like, writing it and saying those words. Like, I like to keep it separate. I really do. Why was it so hard for you? Because I'm just not used to, because you know what, when I'm writing, I'm imagining someone else saying it. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I even know I have to say I, it. I've ever met who said that, because they all, deep in their heart of hearts, are so, yeah, I'll read the lines in the mirror, and I think it's good. No, I mean, for me, the only reason why I say it out loud, I mean, that's what I think helps the sort of me really venturing into acting in a real way, because I always, I have such a great respect for actors, so I'm always saying it out loud. I, I will, like, play with the line for an hour, because I'm saying it, and I'm putting it in my own mouth to see how it feels, and, like, listening to it, like, writing it exactly as how it sounds, you know, and not writing it how I think, oh, I'm going to go to the store. It's like, no, okay, I'm about to go to the store real quick. Is that cool? I'm going to write it exactly like that. So that way it is music. So they can read the music on the page. There's no guessing or them having to make it feel honest in their mouths. I want to make it honest on the page already. So that way it can be a Bible. Um, so for me, like, I'm always thinking, like, I also think, I always think about actors too, like, that I'm like, oh, this person could be good, or what about that person? Or that's exciting to me. So, Writing and now because Thanksgiving was so personal and was sort of very semi autobiographical, it was interesting, but it was odd. It was easy to remember the lines, I'll say, writing it. But I like to keep it separate. And directing is like a whole that's a certain skill set that I don't necessarily want nor need. So it's like, let me hone because I'm also still honing my, my craft There's as also a writer. There's a difference between television and features. I mean, absolutely. And features, you know, that's the beast. control a lot as a writer, but yeah. on the movie set, it's a little bit different. True. But I feel like I have friends who are directors who I like and who I trust and I have a shorthand with, you know, so that way I can say, here's my baby, take care of it. And I'll stand next to you while you feed it. 
And on that oddly distancing note, let's thank Lena Waithe for being you this afternoon.